Today is June 19th, a day proclaimed as a new Labour Day in Trinidad and Tobago. Since 1889, May 1st has been recognised as an international day of solidarity for all workers of the world. But it seems fitting that in this day of independence, we in Trinidad and Tobago choose a day that has deep significance for the nation, workers and managers alike. The Government of Trinidad and Tobago has therefore proclaimed today, June 19th, as Labour Day. On the recommendation of the Public Holidays Committee, and in accordance with the resolution of the Trinidad and Tobago Labour Congress, at its second biennial conference in July 1970, that May Day, May 1, should be replaced by Labour Day, June 19th. Why June 19th? Here's W. Richard Jacobs to provide some answers. The answers lie in the momentous events that took place on that date in 1937, 35 years ago today. These riotous events rock the roots of the colonial society of Trinidad and Tobago. They precipitated West Indian wide riots that moved to Barbados, St. Kitts and Jamaica and together with similar riots throughout what was then the British Empire, they served as the basis for the reorientation of British colonial policy. The riots were local in focus, but international in scope. They were the subject of two major reports. The 1937 Foster Report looked specifically into the causes of the riots in Trinidad in that year. And the 1938 West Indies Royal Commission, more commonly known as the Moyne Commission, looked into the general state of affairs in the West Indies. The riots began on June 19th, but their roots were buried deep in the colonial history of the West Indian people, who had been set upon by the world capitalist system from the very landing of Columbus up through the introduction of slavery and indentureship threatened collapse of that world capitalist system in the great worldwide depression of the 1930s affected the West Indian agricultural economy most of all. And this had far-reaching effects on the whole West Indies, since a large proportion of the working force was employed in sugar and cocoa. The Moyne Commission commented in 1938, The trend of world conditions has become generally unfavorable to the development of territories like the West Indies who base their economic life in the export of agricultural commodities. As a result of these factors, money became scarce for the working class, and their foodstuff, the greater part of which was imported, became increasingly expensive. That was the economic situation in Trinidad in the 1930s. But it was a situation largely confined to the working class, for the big white capitalist planters and businessmen was still making enough money to be comfortable. The same was true in the case of housing, health and education, to name just a few. The working class lived in deplorable houses. Health facilities were inadequate and expensive. Education was available to the privileged few. In 1937, Foster described the village of John John, Port of Spain as an entangled conglomeration of unsightly, ruinous huts and privy cesspits placed helter-skelter on a sloping, steep and slippery hillside, a danger to health, life and limb for the local residents, and a menace to its surrounding city population. In the case of health, the Moyen Commission reported that laborers, peasant farmers, shop assistants, clerks, chauffeurs and domestic servants, among others of the working class, suffer hardship through having to pay the excessively high fees charged for medical treatment. Foster report 
presented an equally serious picture of the health situation. Hookworm was found in 79% of the people in Cunupia, and over 50% of all East Indian adult patients in Port of Spain had enormous numbers of hookworm. The collapse of the economy, the poor returns from agricultural and industrial employment, the disastrous health and housing conditions affected all members of the Trinidad working class, Negroes and Indians alike. Negro and Indian workers both also suffered from racialism at the hands of the white managers in oil and sugar, many of whom had, in the case of oil, come from South Africa, that bastion of white racialism. This racialism accounted in some measure for the hostility of the workers to the managerial class during the riots that were to come. In the judgment of the Moyne Commission, perhaps unlike earlier disturbances, the discontent that underlines the 1937 and 1938 disturbances in the West Indies represents a positive demand for the creation of new conditions that will render possible a better and less restricted life. In Jamaica, Alexander Bustamante and Norman Manley arose to articulate the workers' grievances. In Barbados, Clement Payne paved the way for Grantley Adams. Marichaud was the man in Grenada. A decade later, he was succeeded by Eric Gary, who spoke for the Grenadian working class. Ver Bird spoke for Antigans. For the people of St. Kitts, Robert Bradshaw. Ebenezer Joshua spoke up for workers' rights in St. Vincent. In this field of giants, Tubal Uriah Buzz Butler held his own and superseded many of them. Butler was born in Grenada in 1891. During the First World War, he joined the West Indian Regiment, and like many of the radicals of the 1920s, hero worshipped Captain Cipriani, who was in his heyday as president of the Trinidad Working Men's Association, the TWA. Butler came to Trinidad in 1921 at the age of 30 to work in the oil industry, where pay was more rewarding than in the Grenada nutmeg fields. In 1929, he sustained an injury in the oil fields, which left him with a permanent limp. Sometime between 1922 and 1930, Butler became deeply involved in the evangelizing Moravian Baptist Church. And by 1930, he had established a reputation in the oil belt as a fiery preacher. Many of the members of his congregation worked with him, and he developed a personal relationship with them. Up to 1932, Butler was a strong member of Cipriani's TWA and an equally strong supporter of Cipriani himself. The split be between the two men began in 1932. In that year, the trade union ordinance was passed. Cipriani took the radical position that the TWA should not register under what was essentially a reactionary piece of legislation, but should instead become a political party, the Trinidad Labour Party, the TLP. But this decision, though perhaps acceptable to both Butler and another leading light in the TWA, Adrian Kohler Rienzi, was reached by Cipriani after consultation with English trade union friends. And Butler and Rienzi had no part in the decision. Cipriani's dictatorial approach to decision making alienated both Butler and Rienzi from him. Rienzi then set up his Citizens League in San Fernando in 1934. And in 1936, Butler finally left the TLP and formed his own British Empire Workers and Citizens Home Rule Party, more commonly known as the Butler Party. Butler's decision to form a political party was motivated by the events surrounding the 1935 Apex oil field strike. On that occasion, the workers at Apex went on strike for better pay and working conditions. Cipriani and the TLP did not support the strike because they claimed that it was unauthorized. Authorized or not, Butler led the 120 workers who had been dismissed as a result of their strike action on a march to Port of Spain. By leading this march, Butler successfully demonstrated his commitment to action 
and charged Cipriani with backpedaling and somersaulting tactics. Butler later described Cipriani as a great leader on the war front, thousands of miles from Trinidad and Tobago. Perhaps this was a bit unfair, for Cipriani openly regarded himself as a reformer, while Butler thought of himself as a revolutionary. In that sense, they were incompatible, and the break was inevitable. Butler went his way, closely followed by Rienzi, and Cipriani went his. Faisabad was the base of Butler's party, a town described by the Foster Commission as an unkempt village on the edge of the oil fields. It is from here that Butler appealed to the work people from the standpoint of wages. His speeches and literature, issued by his party, became conspicuous for their violent character, and his following included, as subsequent events confirmed, many who were prepared to adopt violent methods. In his frequent letters to the governor, he mentioned about the rising cost of living, the poor housing conditions, the poor health facilities, etc. And as if by design, included in each letter was an item which highlighted the insults meted out to the black workers by the white managers. As if by design too, Butler's letters and utterances invariably made mention of the suffering of the Negro workers and the Indian toilers, as he called them. Oh, it's a sad thing to remember, you know. And it's sadder still for me to relate today, when things seem to have changed quite a lot. But, as I remember, the conditions of the poor Indians and Negroes in sugar and oil, respectively, was nothing short of subhuman. It was clearly a case for early rectification. But how to do it? Letter after letter was dispatched to the powers that be in the oil and sugar industry. No replies. We turned our attention to the government of the day. Every letter was attended to, acknowledged. But what about the, the alleviation of the condition of these poor workers? Well, nothing was attempted, nothing done. And so I thought that the time had come when we had to take positive action to achieve positive results in so far as betterment of the condition under which these people were forced to live and die and work are concerned. Different words describing the same system of exploitation made Butler's appeal a definite gesture to Afro-Indian solidarity. This approach paid off, for when the workers went on strike on June 19th, it emerged as a strike of all workers, Indians and Negroes, directed against all employers. There are some necessary corrections which must be made in the Foster Report. The Commission suggests that the June 19th strikes were prearranged, and that a signal to start the strike was given by Butler. But after painstaking research, I have been able to ascertain that the strikes actually started by accident. Though the Foster Report acknowledges that the strikes started at Forest Reserve at 4 a.m. on the morning of June 19th, it goes on in apparent contradiction to say that the signal for the strike was given at 5.30 a.m., at least one and a half hours after the strike had actually started. All the information here is garbled and incorrect. During his treason trial, Butler himself refuted the suggestion that he authorized a June 19 strike, or that he had anything to do with any prearranged signal. For some time prior to June 19th, 
Butler had been addressing the workers in the South, telling them to be on the alert because he would call a sit-down strike at any time. At about 2 a.m. in the morning of June 19, 1937, an electrical failure at one of the oil wells close to the road of the Forest Reserve oil field forced the workers at that disabled well to sit down in the vicinity of the well. But the workers who passed on their way to the early morning shift, aware of Butler's impending strike, assumed that the workers at the disabled well had gone on strike. They circulated this rumor, and as a result, most of the workers at Forest Reserve proceeded to participate in a sit-down strike themselves. Apex workers took similar action soon after, and at 5.30 a.m., when the estate police proceeded to remove these strikers from the premises, the retreating Apex workers burnt two oil wells. There was nothing prearranged in this. By 7 a.m. on the 19th, most of the workers of the adjacent oil fields had gone on strike on the assumption that Butler had ordered the strike. In fact, Butler was in La Brea and knew nothing about the strike until about 10 a.m. on the 19th when a delegation of workers arrived at La Brea and informed him that the strike was spreading. Though he was at first apprehensive about sanctioning the strike, when Butler arrived in Faizabad at approximately 2 p.m. on the 19th of June, he was enthusiastically greeted by a large crowd and apparently decided at that time to support the strike. Later in the evening, around 7 p.m., the police attempted to arrest Butler for using violent lang language and counseling acts of violence while he was addressing a meeting. But the crowd prevented the police from arresting Butler and a plainclothes policeman, Corporal Charles King, who attempted to arrest the escaping Butler, was beaten by the crowd. Oil was later poured upon him and he was burnt to death. These events have, over the last 35 years, been commemorated in Faisalabad. The following short excerpt shows how it was commemorated in 1965. Labour and workers meet again to mark the 20th anniversary of the 1937 riots at the famous Charlie King Corner in Faisalabad. After his jump attempting to escape incensed workers, King, a policeman, was burnt to death. To labour militant for its rights, attention was also given. This year, government moved swiftly in labour legislation and introduced the Industrial Stabilisation Act, remembering a worker who fell. And Uriah Buzz Butler, 1937's dynamic labour leader, These were the workers who marched 50 miles into Port of Spain in 1937 to improve the lot of labor. Before the rising sun. Before like an ever rolling stream. And Butler, the old fighter, now honored as a patriot and granted a pension by government. The men and women of Trinidad and Tobago who contributed to the vibrant development of the trade union movement. The spot where Le Bray Charles died. With the labor sector active and alert, the Industrial Stabilization Act with an industrial court provides the guidance and framework for the development of trade unionism. Butler stayed in hiding for three months and though a reward for $500 was offered for information leading to his arrest, he was harbored in various parts of Trinidad and Tobago and later spirited to Venezuela without detection. As Eric Williams has written, speaks volumes for the unity of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the loyalty to Butler that no one volunteered to claim the reward. It was a united front of all the workers in the colony, irrespective of occupation and irrespective of race. Butler had become a national hero and Trinidad and Tobago 
had received a new political leader. The workers reacted positively and rapidly to the initial strike that had been sanctioned by Butler. While Butler was in hiding, the strike spread rapidly throughout Trinidad. On June 20th, Faisabad flared up again. On the 21st, a crowd of several hundred stoned the police at Point Fortin. On the following day, the workers set up a roadblock to ensure that no vehicles were operative within the strike-bound area. When the workers attempted to enter the refinery with a view to preventing hostile forces from regaining control, three of them were killed by police gunshots and four others wounded. The police were exonerated by the Foster report on the grounds that the only steps which could have been taken in the circumstances to save the paramilitary police and the refinery. On the morning of 21st June, the working class took over San Fernando, where they roamed the business quarter of the town, closing down shops, threatening individuals, and holding up traffic. Later on, they closed down the electricity station in San Fernando. But when the workers attempted to take over the telephone exchange, two more of their number were killed and eight more wounded. Around 12 noon on the 21st, the sugarcane workers at Houston St. Madeline joined the domestic servants in taking over the factory, the trains, and the staff-occupied bungalows to which they had previously been denied access except as servants. Here they confiscated furniture and household goods. They closed down the electricity and water supply, assaulted and insulted the white company officials who had earlier maltreated them, and left only with the vow to return in the night. In Pinal to the south, five more workers were wounded by police gunfire. Only one policeman was wounded by a stone. On the 22nd of June, the workers at Waterloo and Wyabee Sugar Estates went out on strike. At Woodford Lodge, another worker was killed and two more wounded. On the 22nd of June, at the instigation of Timothy Rudal, the strike spread to Port of Spain where, like San Fernando of the previous day, work at all the industrial establishments had ceased. One Port of Spain worker was wounded. Rio Claro on the same day, in an effort to prevent the workers from taking over the oil field at Guayaguayari, five workers were killed and 20 wounded by police gunfire. Two policemen were wounded, one by police gunfire, the other by a stone. Commenting on these killings, the Foster Commission said, We are satisfied that in opening fire initially, the police were justified, for not only were they in imminent danger of being overpowered and disarmed, but they were themselves actually being fired upon. We agree, however, that the continued firing by the police was not justified. But even so, no police were brought to trial. In Dinsley Village, two more workers were injured. Indians and Negroes, sugar and oil had united in blood as well as an effort. In all, 14 workers and two policemen were killed. 59 workers and nine policemen were injured. In all, about 2,000 officers and men were mobilized against the workers. In addition, two warships with 210 officers and men were urgently called to Trinidad from Bermuda. Together, they brought the disturbances to a halt, but the strike continued, and Butler remained in hiding, protected by the protesting workers. Throughout the entire drama, the focus was on Butler. He had threatened the strike and supported the workers when they took premature action. Rienzi was on the sidelines supporting Butler. And Cipriani, absent from the scene, was on his way home from England where he had gone to attend the coronation of King George VI. The only one of these three who had the workers' confidence was Butler. Cipriani certainly did not. While he was away, the general secretary of his organization, the Trinidad Labour Party, pledged his party's solid support to quote him for the government. 
And when Cipriani returned from Buckingham Palace, he stated that, and I quote, it is with great pleasure indeed that I make the definite statement that none of those concerned either directly or indirectly are members of the TLP, unquote. He urged the strikers to use constitutional means to express their grievances. But neglected to point out that the Crown Colony system, which permitted less than 10% of the adult population to vote, provided no constitutional means by which the workers could express their grievances. It was a serious omission on Cipriani's part, and it was this type of posture that caused Butler to dismiss him in the way that he did. And it was Butler's commitment to the total revolutionization of the Crown Colony system that made him, as Williams observed, the hero and spokesman of the working class. Yet the Crown Colony government refused to recognize Butler for what he was. Instead of calling Butler out of hiding to negotiate on behalf of the workers, they hunted him like a common criminal and set up a mediation committee to hear the workers' grievances. They established contact with Butler through Rienzi, who had Butler's complete confidence and became his accredited emissary. In the course of the negotiations, Butler, whose British Empire Workers and Citizens Home Rule Party lacked proper organization, admitted that he could not order the workers back to their jobs. The police took this as a signal to crush the strike, and through a process of intimidation, the strike was broken, and most of the workers returned to their jobs by July 5th, 17 days after the strike had started. In the judgment of Eric Williams, the disturbances of 1937 were a close approximation to a general strike. These strikes and disturbances signaled the beginning of mass political consciousness in Trinidad and Tobago and gave the workers the type of self-respect which they had never achieved since leaving Africa and India. This self-respect and self-confidence were the basic requirements for freeing the country from colonial rule. In recognition of the workers' achievements, the governor and the colonial secretary paid unusual tribute to the strikers and their leader. Listen first to the governor. On Butler, His Excellency had this to say. It seemed to me that while Butler was somewhat extravagant in his views, there was sincerity in the man. There was, running through his speeches and through his letters, an undercurrent of sincere appeal. Now, what caused these riots? A Dutch doctor with 20 years' experience in the field told me that he had never seen such distressing conditions as existed amongst the East Indian population, where apparently men and women suffered from a deficiency of all the known vitamins. This was nothing but a total condemnation of the Crown Colony government. Listen to the governor on the racial situation. I am quoting complaints which run through numerous documents and more particularly through all Butler's letters and speeches. The employing class is largely white. The employed almost wholly colored and mostly West Indian. A considerable number of young white men have been taken on in higher posts to the exclusion of the senior colored man. I have just received a report which shows that the attitude of the white employers goes a great deal towards cultivating racial hatred and that fear of the white man was being encouraged instead of respect for the white man. This to my mind goes to the heart of the matter. And I am certain that the white employer class in Trinidad will find intact and sympathy a shield far more sure than any forest of bayonets to be planted here. Then there is the red book or service book. The employers tell me that this book is used to ensure that if a man occupies a skilled position he can command a wage in accordance with his merits. Labour, on the other hand, believes that this book 
is used to prevent men from moving from occupation to occupation. This was as clear an indication as any of the chasm existing between the black workers and the white employers. On the economic issue, the governor had this to say. We have the fact that the increase in the cost of living has gone up by 17%. That is a large matter for the lower paid men. But in defense of the oil industry, he stated an apparent contradiction. As far as I know, there is no good ground for an all-round increase in the oil industry. Concerning the agricultural workers, the governor revealed that wages have been pressed down. When a man has not got a living wage, he cannot possibly be efficient. He is worried there are debts, rent unpaid, wife ill, a number of hungry children to be fed. Nobody can put in a proper full day's work under these conditions. Now in the urban areas, a very large majority of the 15,000 school children of Port of Spain go, do not get a breakfast in the course of the day. With a refreshing frankness, the governor stated that as far as he was concerned, the Crown Colony government was just as much to blame as anyone else. In a thinly veiled tribute to Butler, His Excellency concluded, I think that the colony has had a salutary purge as a result of these riots, which, given goodwill on both sides, should render the colony more prosperous and more happy. The riots have been a warning to the employers that they should be more generous, sympathetic and patient. The colonial secretary, M. H. Nankiville, agreed when he said that the strikes now permitted Trinidad to enter a new era. Another tribute by the colonial secretary to Butler, the 14 martyrs and the working class. In the past, we've had to salve our consciences with humbug, and we have had to satisfy labor with platitudes. These days have gone by. There can be no question today of government the oil industry and the sugar industry not being able to pay a fair wage. Only the circumstances of the riots could have permitted the colonial secretary to warn the sugar industry. We must we keep the workers employed, but we must keep them employed in decent conditions and not in conditions of economic slavery. Though the colonial secretary and the governor might very well have been right, Butler was really seeking the overthrow of the Crown Colony system and the substitution of a truly Trinidadian personality, a Trinidadian political culture. But Butler's party was inadequate to the task of achieving these goals. It lacked both proper organization and a functional ideology. To say this, and to recognize that both Butler and the 1937 riots fell far short of their goal, is not in any way to devalue Butler's tremendous contribution to the awakening of mass political consciousness in Trinidad and Tobago. After the riots, Butler was brought before the court, but Butler did not accept the court's jurisdiction over him. He challenged the legitimacy of the government and questioned the rights of the court to try him. In doing so, he proclaimed in typical Butler style, the Butler point of view is that this government a crown colony form of government is not constitutional. And furthermore, Butler is absolutely and completely opposed to crown colony government in this day and age. And so, a court that is set up by a crown colony government cannot be capable of trying Butler or convicting Butler. I reject any verdict coming from this court. I reject any verdict coming from this court. Even so, he was convicted of sedition and given the maximum sentence of two years imprisonment. He appealed unsuccessfully to the Court of Criminal Appeal of Trinidad and Tobago. But a subsequent appeal to the Privy Council in the United Kingdom was allowed on the grounds that the court which had heard the original appeal 
was not properly constituted. Butler had been discharged shortly before the Privy Council gave judgment. He had served his two years for no crime. Shortly after, he was rearrested and put in detention because it was feared that he might be a threat to the British World War II effort. He was finally released in 1945. While Butler was in jail, Cipriani was promoted to the Executive Council as a representative of a labor movement that had long rejected him. Rienzi, with authority of Butler behind him, proceeded in 1937 to form and become President General of the Oil Field Workers Trade Union and the Oil Trinidad Sugar Estate and Factory Workers Trade Union. In 1943, Rienzi, like Cipriani before him, was promoted to the Executive Council. Less than nine months later, Rienzi accepted the civil service post of Second Crown Council and resigned from the trade union movement. The colonial secretary, M. H. Nankiville, was sent to another colonial assignment and was replaced by George Linden, another Englishman who became industrial advisor to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. The governor, Murchison Fletcher, whose unexpected speech about the workers' grievances, though factual, was described by the Foster Commission as unfortunate and untimely, was persuaded by the colonial office to tender his resignation from the colonial service on the grounds of mental ill health. All these events and circumstances merge into one and contribute to the significance that is June 19th, Labor Day. Today, as we celebrate what I am always pleased to refer to as the Butlerites Thanksgiving Day, I call upon one and all of my warriors to lift their hearts to Almighty God in joyful praise and thanksgiving for the victories, the working class victories, the immortal victories, the epic victories of labor under God and Uriah Butler in the history-making days of June 1937. Glory to God in the highest. Long live labor. Long live the servants of labor in Trinidad and Tobago. Tubal Uriah Buzz Butler, the chief servant, was elected to the Legislative Council in 1950. He lost his seat in 1961. As a recognition for his service to the country, he received his country's highest award, the Trinity Cross, in 1970.